If you love Baltimore sports, you'll love WNST.net. Focus on the similarities and not the differences. Pull over. You guys can sit next to each other. Don't make Luke sit and play. Come on, man. It's a charity event. Cool by y'all moment. All right. All three of you have done something that you set out to do, and all of you have done it once. Some of you have done it as assistant coaches, I understand. But there is a similarity in this journey of winning Super Bowls, right? And uh, I would say the Pittsburgh-Baltimore thing, as cities, we probably have more in common as fans. Probably why we don't like each other so much, right? And you guys as coaches put out to do this and accomplished it. I want to hear your thoughts about winning a Super Bowl and what it's meant to you long term. It's been eight years for you, Coach, right? Almost three and a half for John and now 15 for Coach Billick. So, uh, for, for you to win, what does it mean 15 years later that you can wear the ring? John forgot his tonight, but uh, yeah, it's all right, though. I mean, he was in a hurry. Yeah, that's all right. We need his mics up, guys. You know, the big, and I've told the story many times. For me, and, and these guys know that, that that forget the year, forget the week, that day is the longest day of your life. Just the anxiety of waiting for the game to be played. You go through what seems like I'm going to you normally say that three hours are the most excruciating but it's like six hours by the time the pregame and everything's done and and then you win and and we were fortunate our game was one where we pretty much I just did an event in New York last night and anytime I'm around Giants fans it's always great you know they're going coach but yeah you beat us but but you know that you that interception if that interception hadn't been called it back it wouldn't have been 34 to 7 it would have been 34 to 14 you know? <laughs> so we we had the game in hand pretty early and and as you as everybody knows afterwards it's one hell of a party and in the infinite wisdom of the National Football League, they decide that the winning head coach needs to stand in front of a room about this big with about 450 members of the national media at 8 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> you know. And so about 4, 4.30 in the morning, I figured I need, to go, I need to go back up and refresh myself, try to get a little bit of a nap before I got to go stand in front of the media, who loved me so much when I was here. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm about an hour away, and I get in the shower, and I have, for lack of a, a better term, I had a panic attack. It was an honest to God, because if you remember, it was in our second year, and it was a sense of, my God, what do I do now? Because you know the minute you get one, what's the first question? Can you do it again? And, and, and obviously, you know, you get over it and go, okay, yeah, well, we'll just go get us another one. But that sense of, I'm not going to say my life was going to be better or worse, but I knew my life was going to be different going forward because of that experience. Coach Tomlin. You know, I share a similar experience. I, I was fortunate enough to be on uh, the Buccaneers staff in 02, and that was my first world championship experience. And, you know, for me, um, it was a defining moment professionally. Um, it went from being a dream, something that you imagine what it would be like, um, to reality, and I just think professionally, um, it changed me forever. I think, you know, my day-to-day -day actions since February of 2003 have been planning, um, you know, strategizing, working in an effort um, to, to pursue what I know about now, as opposed to what I imagined about, you know. Um, it's probably one of the few things in life that is just as you imagined it. You know, uh, when that confetti comes raining down on you, it's one of those surreal moments. And, uh, you know, you fast forward, um, I didn't quite enjoy uh, my journey as a head coach as much because there's responsibility <laughs> that comes with being as a head coach that, that I didn't feel as an assistant. Um, and one of the responsibilities is that media uh, breakfast uh, or session that Coach Bilk was referring to myself, I was on stage rapping with Snoop Dogg at 5 a.m. <laughs> and had to gather myself, <laughs> and did, and went to uh, my press function. Uh, but it's one of those events in life um, that forever changes you from a perspective standpoint, and, uh, and it really changes the spirit in which you, you work, that knowing. Uh, there's no substitute for, for life experience, and that is, that is one to cherish. John. Well, for me, I get to, I get to dance with my daughter. 
I got to dance with my daughter for the party. So it was like four hours of dance with my daughter and she didn't want to go home, but what she didn't realize is the families had the flight out early in the morning. She didn't want to get up either. So that was her first all night date and we had a great time doing that. But the other part of it was the, the brotherhood and Jamil knows this is, is that that group of guys, you know, we talked about this beforehand, but if we, if we find a way to win this game, we will walk together forever as champions. And you have that, you, you become a family and a part of that. And then the other thing that was unique for ours was the guy across the sideline actually was family. It was my brother. And uh, we were just in another fight. It was just one more fight that we were a part of, it seemed like. And he didn't call me till about two and a half weeks later and he was still complaining about the officiating. So, <laughs> but we walk across the field, you know, the, the, the thing that you know, I would always kind of wonder about and had coached one in Philadelphia as an assistant. We lost that one, unlike you guys. But, you know, that's another experience too when you don't win it because they, they bring the yellow tape out and they rope it off and they push you outside of that, that, that tape real fast and you're forgotten just like that. So you realize how important it is when you get to that game to win that game. And Ray Lewis had said that. He said, that's what legacies are made of. What's your legacy gonna be? You know, we're not gonna be the team pushed outside that rope. But then, you, as a coach, you imagine, what will it be like in that moment when you realize you win the game? And, and you see the old tape, and I saw Coach Billick and, and what he did, and I knew what Coach Tomlin, I knew, I know what, the, Jimmy Johnson, you know, the arms up in the air, and, and, and Parcells and all those guys, you remember those moments? And for me, I just thought, I gotta go over there and shake my brother's hand one more time, and what's gonna happen? I wasn't really sure. So I thought maybe I'd go give him a, a quick, you know, hug, like a shake and a, a, you know, a bro hug, you know, love you, bro, you know, proud of you, something like that. So I go to shake his hand, Mike, and you're gonna be me shaking my sure. hand. So you come to shake the hand, you go to put the hand right around my shoulder. He goes, <laughs> he sticks his hand out just like that. Gives me the stiff arm, he says, there'll be no hug. And I'm like, what? He goes, there'll be no hug. <laughs> Okay, uh, that was my defining moment as a special team. I, I got I to share a story during the week. Uh, and, and I tell you what, I, as I, I, I had more fun at your Super Bowl, much more fun at your Super Bowl than mine. Because as a head coach, other than go to practice and the commissioner's ball, I never left the hotel. You don't realize everything that's going on. Well, in New Orleans, God, we had that. We had a boat oh, drive. we had a hell yeah. of a time. So John, John, John was kind enough to, to let me to interview him and talk to him for the NFL Network uh, late in the week. And so we're sitting talking about this and that and whatever it means. And so we're done. And, so, and he's been very accommodating. And I said, I just got one question. I said, let's fast forward to Easter. All the families together, OK? <laughs> and everybody's there. You're coming down to Easter dinner. Do you wear the ring or not? <laughs> and the look that came over his face, he goes, Ooh, that was, there was going to be an ass whooping if that ever happened. <laughs> there, have been, there have been no Easter's, no Thanksgiving's, no <laughs> Christmas's ever since. But I'll tell you one moment, you guys might, you guys might be able to comment on this too. Is, so it's, uh, it's after you have the pregame meal and you go back up to your room you, to grab your bag before you're going to get on the bus to go to the stadium for the game, right? And there's about a half hour, 40 minutes in there of time that you really, it's dead time. And I remember in our hotel was overlooking this, this plaza that all the fans were gathering for pregame. And I remember it well, and some of you all were there, it was about nine to one purple, purple. versus red. And I could just see purple everywhere. I mean, it's like, we, it's like we own the city with purple. And I'm looking out and it's like, man, this is meaningful. And I know the whole, the fans marched down to the stadium. And all I could think about was for, beforehand was, this is Super Bowl. Man, I hope I don't screw this thing up. You know, <laughs> dear God. Dear God, I want to make a good decision and not, not this, you know, not blow this thing, you know, and try to do things right because the whole world is going to be watching and this is kind of a big game. And then you gather yourself up, you get on the bus, you drive over there, and it's just, it's really another football game. So I want to interject here. When I, uh, I got to know Mike after the three victories, y'all remember we lost the championship game, Flacco threw the pick to Palomalu, John's first year, right? And I ran into Mike, and Mike famously said to me, the only thing better than kicking your asses three times would be four. And John heard it, right? I mean, and, and David heard it at this thing. I did. I said it. <laughs> and he meant it. I did. He did. He said it. He meant it. Fast forward three years later, right? We won, right? We won the Super Bowl, and we're at an owner's meeting, and this was at the Biltmore in Phoenix. And John's over here under a tree. Now, he had just beaten his brother. His brother was there. You had your wives. And you guys were famously having a family time there. You had fun together. 
And John's over talking to Mike Silver or somebody, and Mike grabs me and says, get Harbaugh over here. We're going to have a drink. And I said, dude, John is not coming over here. You know, John's not going to come over here. And my wife was with me. And I went over, I said to John, I'm like, come over and say hello to Mike. He's like, nah, man, I'm not rubbing it in. I'm not that, I'm not going to do that. He said, I'm not going to rub it in. I went back to Mike and I'm like, he won't come. And Mike said, come on, we're going to go get him. And Mike went and grabbed him and brought him over and we sat down. And within two minutes, it melted. And it melted when I started talking to them about your parades. You know, you told stories to each other about what the parades were like. And when we got back, I ran into Flacco going into the stadium. The first, this is Joe's competitiveness. The first thing Joe came up to me, he said, hey man, was this one bigger than the first one? All Flacco wanted to know was that your parade was bigger than your parade. And I said, no offense, you know I love you. It was bigger. It was bigger the second time if you're down here. Talk about the parades, because I think that that's a similarity in the love of football and something that, for everyone here attend the parades, were you at one or the other? You must admit, there's nothing like that. There's nothing else that I will ever attend, no political rally that would be like what we had here after these championships. And same thing for you in Pittsburgh. You know, I, I really think it's just the, the sheer joy and, um, and, and getting a sense of having the, the blessing to be a part of something that provides moments for people, for families, uh, that enriches their lives. Uh, we're all very blessed, obviously, to do what it is that we do, to, to do that we, what we love to do. Um, but it's moments like that that you see the, the impact of sport, uh, football, uh, and how it, it provides moments for us, moments for loved ones to share. Um, and, and to me, um, that's a tremendous blessing. I'm very humbled to for those moments, to, to experience those moments, to see them, and uh, to think that a game provides that. Uh, it's just a tremendous blessing. Uh, and sometimes it, you know, it makes problems and issues and agendas and so forth seem really small. Our parade? Yeah, well, it's uh, the thing I remember, a couple things. First of all, you, you start the parade and, and, you, and you see faces, and, and they were seven, eight, nine deep, and. I mean, there was, I don't know, 100,000. It seemed like 200. It seemed like everybody in the world was there. But the, when, you, when you go by the parade and you're driving by people and you see just like we're doing, you get, you get eye contact and you make a connection and you see the joy in their faces that Mike is talking about and you have a moment. I mean, I think I'll remember those faces. I feel like if I see many of those faces on the street, I would, I know that person. It's like you have a moment of a connection. And then as we get toward the end of the thing, I heard that the, the parade collapsed and they'd overrun Ray's, Ray's, car at the end. You know, I almost got killed. Yeah, Ray, I was okay. there. You know, the, it, is Ray going to make it to the, to the parade? And then we, we came up around the corner to the stadium and we heard that they were going to close the stadium. They, they'd shut the stadium People down. were climbing the walls to try to get into the stadium, they literally. They were hanging off the Raptors, climbing in, and they're, they're pulling them down off the deal because the place had filled up. It was just one of those moments that was just it's crazy. And Dick Cass had told me the day before, I said, well, how many think will come, you know, be in the stadium? He goes, 25, 30,000. It was like 125,000 and they closed the stadium. Our parade, I showed up, first guy I saw was Coach. You were the first one there. He took one look at me and said, they let you in? <laughs> and I wound up riding on the float with Spencer Falau and Mike Flynn. Spencer was supposed to be here tonight, and I've, I've never seen anything like riding in the parade. I walked through our parade, but riding in the parade, up from high, that's, there's nothing like that. Well, it's odd for me. I remember uh, my wife Kim and I were driving down. It was a, kind of a rainy, ugly day. It was and, very ugly. Boy, yeah. I, yeah, wonder how, like same thing. Wonder how many people are going to show up. So we we staged up in the stadium. We had all these Humvees and that whatever. So we 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 come up from the stadium, and there's nobody there. We got the police escort and everything. And I'm thinking it's going to be kind of embarrassing if no one shows up for this thing. And we start to approach Pratt, and the and the uh, the, the police escort gets us up and they stop and the guy whips around, there's three or four of them on the motorcycles and they come back and the, and the one cop gets off and, and he was ashen in his face. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life because you turned onto Pratt Street and from Pratt Street Straight all the down. way down, it, yeah, I mean, they're hanging from the rafters, the butt, it was, it was the, yeah, it's, it's a surreal moment. We did that at City Hall. So we, we, we reversed the parades both times. Luke, I, want, I know you put a bunch of questions together. I want to let you have at it. Yeah, I think one of the great things about this night is the camaraderie, despite the fact this is Raven Steelers. I mean, the premier rivalry in the NFL over the last 15 years. So 
I wanted to hear each of your thoughts. Brian, you in the early years of this rivalry with Bill Cowher and then John and Mike, what this rivalry means to you and how much pride you've taken in being a big part of that. Well, and, and we all come into it, you know, we, we didn't grow up with it, so to speak. So you come in from the outside. None of us grew up in Pittsburgh or in, or in uh, Baltimore. I, I must tell, share a story with you. Last year, and, and for my work with the NFL Network, I do four or five training camps. And I go and I spend the day and I watch practice and, and do all those things that you do. And last year I start out and I'm in Baltimore. John staff were very gracious. I'm there all day. And John graciously asked me to say a few things to the team, which was a great thrill for me. Uh, and then, then I'm driving up to Latrobe. Now think about it. I'm driving to Latrobe, Pennsylvania. I get in about midnight. And, and, and it's a beautiful drive. Of course, it's about four and a half, maybe five hours. I'm lost, of course. And I get into a hotel. I don't even know where I'm at. And so I get up in the morning. I've got like a nine o'clock call. I've got to be over at the stadium. And so I get up, and again, I'm barely cognizant of where I am. I get up and I come down, and it was like a Twilight Zone nightmare. Because this is one of those hotels that has a buffet breakfast. And when I mean everybody had a Steeler jersey on, I mean the guy behind the desk, the people serving the food, all the patrons, all of them. So I'm walking in to what looks like a Steeler team picture. And I'm just thinking, please, God, I hope nobody recognizes who I am. <laughs> It, it was unbelievable, and then had a great day, and Coach was very gracious to... to, to, to did, they, did they recognize you? Uh, a, a few did, <laughs> and, uh, it, but, but it was great. They, uh, it was more at the stadium when the, I think the fans knew I was up there, and I had a security detail. I just wanted to get out without collateral damage. If you love Baltimore sports, you'll love WNST.net.